종류. The woman they call the South Side Butcher. When I hear somebody trying to sell me on a better life, I gotta ask myself, what is so bad about the life they got? If I wanted to get the porters into a union, what's the first thing I should do? Always go for the head. That's where the vision is. You think I need a partner? I think you need a man who knows every vein in the trains. I know y'all might be scared of what might happen if we do this, but maybe it's time we start thinking about what happens if we don't. What I offer these boys is not one day, maybe it is in their hands right now. But it's union shit you're talking about. And that's danger. You sure you don't want to work with me? You sure you don't want to join the movie? I'm good. I gotta spend the rest of my life bowing and smiling. People rather spit in my face than killing me with your kindness. Worth a Pepsi. The most invisible man on the earth. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, wherever you are in any part of the province of Saskatchewan, Canada, or even the world. Can I get a round of applause in the comment section? I'd like to see you use the clapping emoji yes yes keep it coming keep it coming welcome good evening everyone i'm excited to be here my name is dami adeni and i'm the founder of damiadeni.com a platform that celebrates blacks and africans in the diaspora especially canada um and we're here tonight on a very special occasion to celebrate cbc's new series the porters but before we proceed i would like to acknowledge that i'm coming to you live from the lands of Territory 4, the origin lands of the Kwe, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect and honor the treaties that were made on all territories. We acknowledge the harms and the mistakes of the past, and we, co we are committed to moving forward in partnership with indigenous nations in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. We'd like to know where you're watching us live from. So please engage with us in the comments se section. You never know, you might make a friend there on behalf of CBC Sask Saskatchewan and the Saskatchewan African Canadian Heritage Museum. I would love to welcome you once again. Can I get a round of applause in the comments section? <laughs> Set in the 1920s and inspired by real events, the Potter follows train potters, so real life train potters, um, John and Zeke, and their friends and family, as a tragedy on the job sets them on different paths. Um, and it's, it's a celebration of epic um, Black ambition and achievement. I'll be chatting with some of the cast and creator of this show, and at the same time, I'll be chatting with several people who have lived some of these experiences as potters or who their family have been members um, of the potter community. Please, before we begin, I'm thrilled to introduce you to the chair of the Saskatchewan African Canadian Heritage Museum, um, an organization that has been instrumental in making tonight's event possible. Please, as we do it, a round of applause in the comments section for Sharon and Brown. Thank you so much, Demi, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you very much for being here this evening. 
um, to, you know, for us to celebrate this wonderful event for the porters. Um, you know, um, I have, you know, many friends that I've um, reached out to uh, this evening to um, log on and join the event because I've never been a part of this, such a thrilling event, and I, I do know it's going to be successful. So thank you very much for partnering with us uh, this evening. The Saskatchewan African Canadian Heritage Museum, Inc., known as SACOM, is a charitable organization. As many of you know, um, we are dedicated to the people of Saskatchewan, the people of Canada, and to people all around the world who you know, want to um, have a window into our organization. Our museum is a virtual museum. Um, we're online at www.sacom.org. Um, our primary purpose and our mandate is to celebrate, explore, research, document, and preserve the history, heritage, and contributions of people of African ancestry who have lived in our province. And as um, you well know, all of you well know, um, Dr. Shad, um, a very famous um, uh, um, legendary individual of African ancestry who lived in our province um, back in um, 1896. And, you know, we also celebrate the people here in our province. Um, you know, we have such talent here, uh, just a, a huge um, um, organization of people across this wonderful province of Saskatchewan um, that, um, you know, we have shared and celebrated um, you know, all of their history and, you know, it's, it's all um, on our website at www.sacom.org. So many people may not be aware that porters have worked out of Saskatchewan since the early years. Um, following World War I, I believe, um, men of African descent worked on the railroads. And as Dami said this evening, we will have some of them um, being featured here tonight to tell their story. Um, so that information regarding um, finding information on the porters can be found on the Western Development Museum website. Hope you guys are watching the porters. It can be seen on CBC Monday nights in Saskatchewan. I believe it's about nine o'clock Mountain Standard Time. And I want to wish everybody good luck tonight and hope you have a successful session. And thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Sharon, and it was such a pleasure ha having you, and thank you for all the work that you do. Now, let's get started. And to kick things off, I have um, some of the members of the crew and cast, and I'm going to be introducing two members of um, the creative team behind the Potters. First, we have Arnold Pinnick, the originator, creator, and the executive producer of the Potter. He also plays Glenford in the series, Arnold was born in the United Kingdom and is a Canadian actor whose career began at Toronto's Second City's main stage. His work in film and television has spanned almost three decades with over 120 credits to his name, which include Exit Wounds, Altered Carbon, Parker Anderson, and much more. Please a round of applause for Arnold. Let's see, let's see you clap in the comment section. Next. We have Charles Officer, who is the executive producer and director. He's an acclaimed writer and is the founder of the Cane Sugar Film Work. His films include multi award winning Achilles Escape, the award winning documentary Mighty Jerome, the award winning Unarmed Verses. Charles' work speaks in his commitment to amplifying diverse stories that integrate the arts. In 2020, Charles participated in developing Canada's first black screen office and is one of the founding members. So glad to have you both here. Please a round of applause once more. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So, so I'm, I have a lot of questions for you guys. Uh, first of all, I'd like to know, um, let's start with you, Arnold. Um, there were so many, there are so many black Canadian stories to be told that are yet untold. Why did you choose to tell the stories of the Porters in particular? Wow. I mean, at the time, I, I didn't know of a lot of Black Canadian stories <laughs> to be told. Um, but uh, I, I guess for me, I, what really got me was just the fact of learning that 
these men and women not only came from the southern states, but also from these small little islands in, in the Caribbean. I would say like Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, St. Kitts, and, and so on. And they came to this country and um, managed to uh, bond together to change policy. Um, you know, they, they literally weave themselves within the very fabric of, of our Canadian flag. And that just really blew my mind. And, you know, when the fact that they formed the first and the largest black uh, union, the Brotherhood of Seaton Car Porters with their American brethren, that just blew my mind. And I was just like, how comes I didn't know about this? So when you go down that rabbit hole and, and learn not only about these, these, uh, these men and what they, uh, and what they stood for within their own communities, uh, and they were the cornerstone, but also the women uh, that also were uh, uh, just as prevalent in those, those communities as well. It was just something that inspired me, and uh, I, I couldn't let it down. I wanted to tell this story, and uh, by the grace of God, to be able to uh, not only have CBC and Sienna Films, but also to have a creative team um, you know, we came to Charles pretty early on, eh, Charles? <laughs> for, for not just the game on board, but also guidance as well. And to have the team of like Charles Officer, RT, Anne Marie, Marsha Green um, to, uh, to help helm this was just such a blessing to get the A team basically uh, together to, uh, to see this all the way through. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Arnold. So to you, Charles, um, Arnold mentioned the influence of um, the Caribbean culture. Why was it so important to um, show this in the series? Because we see um, a character like um, Junior speak in the accent and use some of the slang. So why was it so important to reflect that? I think what we've been, you know, one of the, one of the whole uh, themes of the existence of the show is 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 we want to put something that we haven't seen and that we are aware of culturally amongst ourselves and and we want to actually provide what has been missing and we haven't seen you know the the Caribbean diaspora like uh, you know explored as a community and and uh, I mean we have a broad uh, um, cultural diversity amongst ourselves right here in Canada and to actually show that in the language, in the behavior, in the way, you know, some of the foods that we have. Uh, mm. we, 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 we spoke a lot about that because I think is, you know, pretty much a lot of us are first generation uh, uh, from our immigrant uh, families. And, and we all, you know, I think are hungry to see that representation in our, uh, on our screens and in our storytelling. And, you know, it, it, unfortunately, it's like, you know, in a lot of shows, it's like people still, you know, um, you know, it's like it takes a black show where we get to do that thing. You know, it's like when you see it in other shows or other things, it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's not authentic, you know, it's uh, caricature stuff. And, and that is something that we were, we really just want to, you know, show the dimensions of our, of our, of our, of our culture, uh, the extent of it and, and have that expressed, you know, it's, it's like, it's fascinating because it's like, you know, there are individuals who don't understand or will miss the, the slang or the patois or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's okay. It's okay. You can pick it up. You can get in the nuance. You can get it, whatever. It's, it's sometimes it's just not always about the words because the, it's the words and, and, and the swagger behind it and the behavior around it. And, and that is what we're communicating as well. And that and when we go into, and when we slip in, when Junior and Posse slips into there's familiarity, we do this in our real lives and we don't see that in cinema and television shows. <laughs> and, 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 and so it was our, our goal to not shy away from that. And it's okay if, it's, if, it's, if you miss it, you don't understand it, it's okay. Or go find some Jamaican friends. <laughs> <laughs> Like, again, like you, you, you can go and research supporters and the and the UNIA, but you can also go find out and talk to some people. Mm. It's about our experiences, and you can actually mm. meet the people that way. <laughs> mm. I like that you pointed that out because it's also a learning experience for a lot of people. You know that we can learn different cultures and learn about um, people's journeys. 
Thank you so much for that. So I wanted to really talk about this. One of the most impressive things about this show was how, um, you know, no character was two dimensional. Um, I mean, there were layers upon layers to every character. How important was it to portray the full spectrum of the black experience? Um, I'll over to you, Arnold. Well, I think from day one, that was something that was very much uh, on the mindset because we wanted to showcase these characters three dimensional because we haven't seen characters like this in Canadian television as three dimensional. And, you know, in a lot of cases, you saw these characters, they came in and filled a role or filled a, a, a mindset and then they were gone. You never went mm -hmm. home with them. You never knew what if they were married or not or how um, how whatever was going on on the scene, how it affected them mentally and I, I think to me, uh, it was uh, something that we'd all talked about from day one. Now getting that done and getting that on the on the on the screen, that is where the the art and the intelligence of, of, of Charles comes in to get that uh, that get that across. Thank you so much. And the last question for Charles, because we're going to be bringing you back in. But what do you want the audience to take away from this series? What what, what do you want us to learn from this? What would you like for us to take away from all of this? I mean, I, I think ultimately, I mean, it is it is a television series. I want people to feel entertained and, and engaged and feel love and joy and have their emotions pulled and cry and laugh and all of that stuff. Um, you know, I, I would love for people to take away that, that, you know, this is one entry point into the breadth of stories that exist amongst our people here in Canada. We just opened up the gate and there's so many things to explore within the individual characters that can take you down a whole other role, road to, to make new discoveries about, about this country. And, and, as, as, and for, you know, I like to say that this show is made by us for us mm. because for our youth and for, for like, as well as, you know, Arnold and myself, there are things that we weren't privy to in our upbringing that were available for us to learn and mine and get inspired by and explore and look deeper. Um, and that is what I hope that this show ultimately does uh, is that that's what it does for our community, our, our young black brothers and sisters that, that they find a gateway to, to, in this one sort of space where we made this television show, there's so many elements and facets to find yourself in, and and um, and hopefully there's there's an opportunity that 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 will that will just this show will just spark that that curiosity. And Thank just you, Chuck. Add to that, I just wanted to say that you know. Uh, the byproduct of this as well, and, and, and Charles will definitely manifest this with me, is the fact that this really is a love letter to those men and women that don't have a voice anymore. You know, we're very blessed to have porters uh, on, on the program with us tonight, but there were so many porters before them that laid the groundwork in order for them to have those jobs in order for Charles and I, basically these porters were the people that helped us to have a black middle class in Canada. And we are mm. products of that. Um, and so many writers and producers and directors before us that we're standing on. So it really is a love letter to, to the, those generations of the past. All right, thank you. Okay, so I have a question from um, what one of our viewers and they say, what percentage of early Canadian porters were African Americans? Do you have any idea? Well, I don't know what the percentage was, but in Little Burgundy was quite a lot. Quite a lot of uh, um, Americans came in from the southern states because uh, the, the railways actually went to the United States and set up sort of recruitments to get uh, Americans. Some of the brightest individuals from universities uh, left the United States and came to Canada to work across the country from Vancouver, Hogan's Alley, all the way to uh, Nova Scotia. And of course, uh, the story, the location we're talking about in St. Antoine. And the reality of it is there was a St. Antoine uh, black neighborhood all across the country. Every province had their own little um, black neighborhoods where porters um, uh, um, resonated from. 
All right. Thank you for that. I have another question. Someone says, I'm curious about the kind of feedback that Arnold and Charles have gotten so far. So what have you guys gotten so far well, in terms of feedback? Charles, do you want to take that? Sorry, can, can you repeat that one again? Just kind of... So someone says, I'm curious about the kind of feedback that Arnold and Charles have gotten so far. So what feedback have you gotten so far? How are people reacting to the series? You know, I, overall, I, I've been I've been really pleasantly, you know, um, taking in some comments and 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 from some elders, uh, from you know, some church brothers and sisters from my <laughs> from my family who I, I ran into, and I was quite surprised how how engaged they were and are. Um, in, in surprises, like, because I actually didn't think they'd tune into CBC. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. also, it's like, it's also like, <laughs> shows nothing, but it's also how people find it and how they tune in that I'm like, okay, all right, cool. So, um, because I know that he's not on like on a computer, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. but, um, there's been positive, um, uh, responses about our, our, our cast and our performances across the board. Um, that they've been, you know, uh, authentic and engaging and exciting and 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 uh, really, really um, indiv- like stories and, and characters that people want to follow and stay with. And even, you know, early on uh, after the first episode, even I had people sending me notes saying, you know, there are already characters that I hate and here characters that I love. You know what I mean? It's like I'm like, yo, you haven't even <laughs> we haven't even started yet. Um, and uh, and. And you know the way that our, we 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 know we galvanize the visual tone and look and feel of the show, um, cinematically at the music. Um, I think that that there are all these elements that I think that people have responded to. That I think it's um, you know it's kind of challenging in a way that we are one show that that you know is at the core of these black creators and so on and so forth. But at the same time, it's like so much weight is put on this one show personally and professionally for everyone in our community, you know, whereas these other shows kind of come up, but they don't have to deal with that kind of weight. And, but what I do have to say is that, you know, viewership is, in, is, is critical to any show, any show to continue to provide opportunities. We created the show to create opportunities in front and behind the camera. And in order for that to sustain it, sustain itself, we need our community, people beyond our community to engage and to tune in. Mm-hmm. So I can take the accolades that we've receiving so far, but 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 if that doesn't happen, then we don't have the show to continue to train the next generation mm-hmm. and bring someone else and move someone else up. Like all the other show in the shows in the industry, that's what they do. That's how people get better. That's how a lot of the Caucasian creators in the industry grow and 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 build lives and have careers, is because they've had these sort of momentums with show that survive, that they get to keep working on the craft. So, I think that that is with all the positive stuff coming around the show. I hope that that fuels into the show having a life. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll come back to you guys soon. I want to thank you. I know you're not going anywhere, but thank you, Arnold and Charles. Um, but before we introduce the next guest, let's take a look at them in action. You will love this. Hey, Marlene. Hey, Winchester. How you doing? Good. I was hoping to catch Gwen. Gwen! Are you two trying again? Gwen, what are you hollering for? You know, I gotta get down to the hardware store. Be nice. She did it for Henry. See you tomorrow. Bye. Eli is pulling us off our regular route. He seems to think that we can do just as well on Dubouillon Street. Dubouillon Street? 
You had no right taking those collections. After everything the UNIA has done for this community, the library, the scholarships. And last month, Eli sent our collections to head office for the defense fund. How come he gets to decide what we put our money to? Because he's the man Brother Garvey put in charge here. You need to apologize to him, Marlene. We worked too hard for you to put pride before position. I am not going to apologize to that man for doing right by Henry. Woo! A lot to unpack from that, and we're going to do just that. Um, I'm going to be introducing my next guest, who are stars of the show. First, we have Sabrin Rocks, who is an award-winning Regina Bond. Who's a round of applause for Regina? <laughs> what? What? Regina Bond, actor and director, who has worked across the country on both screen and stage. Most recently, she has been the leading cast in the second season premiere of CW's Two Sentence Horror Story. She can also be seen in The Patcher, The Parker Anderson. The Expanse, Taken, People of Earth, Black Mirror, The Girlfriend Experience, Sabrin portrays the character of Gwen Barnes on The Potter. So happy to have you here. Thank you. And next we have Muna Traore. She's an actor, a writer, and award-winning filmmaker on the rise. Muna was most recently seen in the hit Netflix original series, The Umbrella Academy, one of my favorite shows. Um, Self-made opposite Octavia Spencer, as well as the FXX series, Nine Films About Technology. Um, Muna also writes and produces her own work, including short film Adon, which won the best short film at the Montreal International Black Film Festival. Muna portrays the character of Marilyn Macy on the Potters. Please, a round of applause. <laughs> so glad to have you both. First of all, I'm a fan of your relationship in the show. Um, it's, I mean, there's so much to celebrate. And this is Black, this is, um, sorry, International Women's Month as well. So the sisterhood, the, the friendship, the bond that you guys share. Um, I'm going to start with you, Muna. Um, what was it like working with Sabrin um, and your the dynamics of your relationship? Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Uh, working with Sabrin was so easy. It's kind of incredible because when I first read the script and I was imagining the role of Gwen, I cast Sabrin in my mind. <laughs> and I think, I think I told you that yeah. when I found out you got cast. Um, <laughs> but, you know, as soon as I found out Sabrin was going to be playing Gwen, I reached out to her and we just started developing our own friendship and our own relationship so that we could have something to bring to screen before, um, before we, we got to set. Nice. Thank you so much. I'm Sabrin. Um, how was it? You know, um, one of the beauty of the stories being told, I was talking to Arnold and Charles of how multidimensional the characters were. Um, how was it playing the char your character and um, especially as a mom, you know, what, how were you able to um, bring that into your character? Yeah, um, Gwen is really tight and pretty conservative or seemingly conservative. So at first glance, I was kind of like, how am I, what's my way into her? And then reading more of the scripts, I realized that she, you know, she's a community worker. She's super, super strong. She's been through a lot, obviously, um, the racism and discrimination and um, her and her husband have been trying to start a family and it hasn't happened yet for them. So that was actually my way in is the relationship of, um, mother mother or striving to be a mother and my own personal experience which was just becoming a mother three months before we started shooting so um the whole idea of like wanting something so badly like that wanting a child and to start a family and not being able to um it really resonated with me and the fact that Gwen is able to kind of go out into her community and still help and still assist with births um and be surrounded by families and children and people bearing children all the time mm -hmm. the strength really resonated for me and her and I drew a lot of strength from her as a character 
and and we definitely saw that. Um, Muna, tell us about Merlene. Um, she's a Black Cross nurse who not only has to take care of her community but also her own family while going toe to toe with the United Negro Improvement Association sexist and um, penny pinching male leadership. So how was that? I, it was so exciting. I think of Marlene as being someone who is creatively subversive, someone who um, is very determined to overcome systemic challenges and finds very unique ways to do so. Um, as you can see in the show, Marlene cares deeply for her community. She wants to do right by the people that she she loves and the people around her. And she is going to get whatever she needs to get done by hook or by crook. <laughs> um, I think that um, I feel really lucky to be able to play a character that has so many dimensions and we get to see her face challenges, not only at home and in her family as a mother, but also out in the world and in her career as a Black Cross nurse and dealing with, you know, Eli and his authority within the organization and trying to straddle like a very real desire to do good work, but then being checked in terms of what her place is within the organization mm. and having that fundamental knowledge within herself that like she knows that she can, she knows what she's capable of and she knows what she can do. She's just sort of waiting for the people around her and the system around her to be able to give her the opportunity to. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, this is for you, Sabrin. Can you give some insights into who the Black Cross nurses were and their role within the United Negro Improvement Association? So for those that don't know. Yeah, um, so the Black Cross Nurses was an auxiliary started by Henrietta Vinton Davis. Um, and she was kind of, a, I guess, a disciple of Mar Marcus Garvey. So she was tasked with starting this auxiliary um, and going all over the world and kind of recruiting uh, nurses, so women to kind of go into their communities um, and help different communities all over the world, but obviously in the United States and Canada um, with hygiene, with, um, they played the roles of midwives, they helped educate their communities. So it was um, in a time where, you know, a lot of black folks uh, weren't able to go to regular hospitals where the white folks were going. Um, for a lot of people, this was the way they kind of got education on healthcare and and received healthcare. Um, so that's kind of the, what their purpose served. Uh, I don't know if I'm missing anything, Muna. Is there anything you want to add to that? So in terms of like, you know, helping young mothers, to, um, you know, develop the skills to be able to know, like, you know, with nursing and you know, midwifery type things. And then also one thing that really excited me was um, when we were doing research, um, we were given one of the original Black Cross Nurse handbooks. I don't know if you, you, you got one, Zabrin, right? Yeah. yeah. And I was looking through it and I was like, I do this, you know, in terms of like collecting herbs and making tinctures and, you know, I make all of my own oils and butters. And I was uh, looking at the ingredients of what they were doing in 19, in the 1920s. And it's very similar to a lot of, yeah people now who are making natural remedies and using natural plant medicine. And I think that every, every black woman can sort of identify with that. You know, thank you. Um, we have a question from um, someone in the audience from Donna Paris. And she says, what did either of you know about the black cross nurses before the show? So did you understudy someone or what do you know I about knew, the black? I personally knew very, very little. Um, I think I'd heard a little bit, like maybe a blip somewhere in a documentary somewhere that was kind of stored at the back of my brain, but I'd never really looked into it for whatever reason. And I was quite astounded by, yeah, the influence they had in all the communities and, and also how far spread it was. Like, like I said, all over the world, like people would gather, you know, they would kind of start these different auxiliaries in different parts of the world, which I thought was really incredible. I kind of just assumed it was the United States. So I, I personally learned a lot from just getting cast on the show. Yeah, I knew absolutely nothing about the Black Cross nurses. And I, I, I knew some a, a bit about Marcus Garvey and the UNIA, but as far as like the auxiliary movements within, absolutely nothing. Thank you. So if you have any more questions um, for Sabrin or Mona, please put them in the co comments and I will be asking them. Okay, so... We would like to know, did anything interesting happen on set? Do you guys have any funny stories? 
Let us know. <laughs> Give us the good stuff. <laughs> I mean, lots of really interesting things happened on set. Do tell. Uh, mm -hmm. Something appropriate. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Sabrin, do you have anything? Um, well, for me, honestly, um, because I was a very new mother and Muna will attest to this, I was in that new mother kind of sleep deprived, mm -hmm. have no idea what's going on in any given day. So watching the footage now, like seeing the finished product, I'm so uh, relieved that I don't look like a walking <laughs> zombie because it honestly felt a little bit like a fever dream that those first, mm -hmm. as many people know, those first few months having a newborn are really intense. And then add on traveling to a different province, having to learn lines, having to, you know, breastfeed on lunch breaks and then do like 14 or 16 hour days that mm -hmm. it's a miracle that it, it's, it's actually watchable. My stuff, like well, I was very nervous to watch it because I had no idea. It kind of felt like it happened to me rather than me being in control of it. So um, re-watching re it for the first time, I'll edit it and everything I'll put together is like quite a beautiful experience because I'm actually brought back to that time, which was so raw and so vulnerable, but in an interesting way, I'm seeing it through the work in a way that doesn't make me look, you know, totally frazzled and unwound. It's like this vulnerability in my work that I'm like, okay, wow, that I, I can do that. So that was like a pretty interesting experience that I'd obviously never had before because it's my first child. But yeah, every day was an interesting adventure for sure. Because I was like, okay, I got two hours of sleep. Let's do this 14 hour day. <laughs> Are we going to do this? Well, I think it's like a testament to your talent and your strength as a mother that you were able to channel such and, and create something so beautiful while you were going through all that. I was totally in awe of you every single day. I mean, I'm terrified of bringing a human into this world. And the fact that you did that and just came to Winnipeg and, and, and performed like you did, was just beautiful. I think I told you one day, I was like, yeah. I was like, you birthed a baby. <laughs> you're good um, one um, thing, one honestly, other thing, oh sorry I was just going to mention that has less to do with me but I think Charles, Charles alluded to it as well is looking around and seeing a predominantly black cast and creative team and then mm. also behind the camera as well like I really really I thought it was very special I remember one day I just looked around and seeing people in the crew with less experience people of color learning and I'd really never seen that before because often in this mm. industry, there's no patience for that. There's no patience to train. Mm. You kind of just learn on the job. And I remember seeing people taking their time and educating um, these newer crew members of color on how to do things. And I, that was quite a miraculous thing that I'd never witnessed before on a set. And I feel really privileged to be a part of something that's actually Charles was talking about, like, you know, for the next generations, for people to come up and be able to work on this stuff. Thank you. And I was going to say, Sabrin, you did an amazing job. I never would have known that you just had a baby. It was amazing. It was amazing. You Thank both you. were amazing. We have some questions. Um, so Demi says, how did you prepare for the role? So was there any particular thing you did to specifically get into character? Um, Mona? Um, I watched a bunch of documentaries and videos of like Black women um, during the time period. Specifically, some of them were in Montreal, just to get a sense of how they spoke, the cadence. And I, I read a lot about the time period and about mm -hmm. Black Cross nurses, about sort of the world that we were about to dive into. Um, you know, I have worked on period shows before, but not um, specifically in the 1920s. So it was just sort of like piggybacking on certain things that I'd already learned and gaining new knowledge and then finding some unique ways to explore Marlene and her character and what she meant to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Mona. And the last question, um, how did you enjoy filming in Winnipeg? So Sabrina, you can take this. I love Winnipeg because it feels like a bigger Regina to me. So it <laughs> felt like truly coming home. I, I mm. feel very comfortable there. I, there are a lot of similarities um, to the two cities. So I, I, I loved working there. The people are, you can't beat prairie folks. Um, mm. The hus hospitality, the openness, and also just like 
the the space and the skies and I, I really do miss that about the prairies you don't get those big blue open skies in Toronto so um getting to be in Manitoba for most of the summer was such a gift because it really did feel like home hmm. thank you so much Mona and Sabrin we'll be bringing you back on um thank you so much for your time and if you have more questions for them please feel free to use the comment section and as we do it here, a round of applause in the comments. I want to see, I want to see your emojis. A round of applause, a round of applause, a round of applause. Before we get into, before we get to our special conversation with former porters, here's a glimpse from the show into the rigorous and the demanding and the demands of the profession. Check it out. I've been low, I've been high, I've been sold all my life. I've got nothing left to play. I've got nothing left to say. I'm a black man in a white world. I'm a black man in a white world. I'm a black man in a white world. I'm a black man in a white I'm in love, but I'm still sad. I found peace, but I'm not glad. On my nights, on my days, I've been trying wrong. Oh, I'm a black man in a white world. Whew. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for staying tuned and thank you for watching. Um, next, we have Carol. We're thrilled to have Carol join us. Um, Carol, is, Carol Lafayette Boyd is a volunteer and executive director of the Saskatchewan African Canadian Heritage Museum. Carol, such a pleasure to have you here. Hi, thank you, Dami. Glad to be yeah. here. Yes. Okay, so we'd like to know, um, tell us about the generations of porters in your family. Okay, but first I'd like to say what a pleasure it is to be part of this event, especially because we have our own Regina-born actor, Sa Sabrin Ro uh, Rock here, a member of the cast, and congratulations, Sabrin, and the whole cast and crew. Uh, you guys did a great job. Well done. Okay, so my connection to the Porters is having three generations of family members as Porters. The first generation is my mom's uncle, Bob Jamerson. He was born in 1894 in, in Texas and traveled from Oklahoma in 1910 with his parents to settle in Amber Valley. Alberta, and that's a black settlement north of Edmonton. It was. In 1916, he enlisted in number two construction battalion and went to Europe in World War I with, those guys went with no guns to help cut trees and, and build and operate a logging railway. There were about a total of 750 men from Canada, the U.S. and the Caribbean. But up, upon returning, the main jobs that they could get were porters on the railway and if, uh, for people's information, the federal government will this year on August the 9th be offering an apology for the poor treatment they received on return home because mostly they can only get jobs as porters. And that's what happened with my Uncle Bob, my first generation there, who became a porter. My second generation is my dad's brother, Ernest Lafayette. He was born in 1904 in Oskaloosa, Iowa, and he came with his parents to Regina in 1906, where my Father Carl was born in 1907, and he may have been the first person of African descent to be born in Regina. And my grandparents homesteaded in the Anglia, Fisk, McGee, Herschel area. That's just uh, west of uh, Saskatoon and Rosetown. And uh, five of his six sons ended up having farms there. And Uncle Ernest had a farm, but he left the farm in the late 40s to become a porter. And uh, so he retired as a porter out in Vancouver. Now the third generation was my brother, well, is my brother Arnold, who was only one of us eight siblings to be born in hospital. And uh, he joined the railway as a red cap in the fifties. And he worked out of Saskatoon, Calgary and Winnipeg. And that's nice where the Porter series was filmed. And, um, and he also worked in Montreal in the city where the story is based. And while in Saskatoon, he worked with uh, Elwood Mays, and uh, we knew him as Sparky because Arnold would bring him down to the farm when they had time off at uh, when they worked in Saskatoon. And now Elwood, I'd like to call him Sparky, but Elwood uh, is a descendant of the Mays family who came in 1910 from Oklahoma 
to the Eldon district. And that was just north of Maidstone and west of North Battleford. And that was the other black settlement of, of that 1910 group. And the, only this one was in Saskatchewan. They were known as the Shiloh people. And the church there is now a provincial heritage property. Now, what's unique about uh, Elwood Sparky Maze is that there's four generations that were involved in the railroad. There was his father, there's him, there's his two sons, and now he has a grandson who is also involved. So I, I just find that amazing, and I, I think you'll enjoy talking to them. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Carol. Thank you so much for um, that that brief history of um, generation of potters in your family. Would you say that there has been any influence, personal influence that, you know, um, your relationship with them has had on you? Well, I, I didn't know a lot of this that, that um, I knew my, they were all had been porters and, and red caps and things like that, but I didn't realize what they had gone through. Like my uncle having been in the war and coming back and, and that being the only job he could get. And so that's that's been very interesting, learning all of this new stuff. And even about, you know, the Black Cross nurses, never heard of that before. Um, just uh, all the very important history that we have here in Saskatchewan. All right. Thank you so much, Carl. We'll just have um, the potters, the, um, former, the potter from the Saskatchewan family um, that has long-standing connection with to the railway coming. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi, Demi. Hi, hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure Hello. to have you on again. Now, um, I would like to introduce everyone to um, this wonderful Saskatchewan family that's had a long-standing connection to the railway. Please join me in welcoming Earl Woods, a.k.a. Sparky, um, Terry, and Dwayne Maines. Hi, everyone. Hello there. Yeah. Hi. And my son, Nathan, now he's joined us. Hi. <laughs> Hi Nathan, it's a pleasure Hi, to Amy. have it's a pleasure to have you all. So um, let's start with um, Elwood. Um, why did you get into? Um, at what age did you become a potter? Uh, I think I was nineteen or twenty, but there was no work anywhere, eh? Oh, and, and for how long did you, you do this? Pardon. And for how long were you a porter? Uh, well, I wasn't a porter. I was a red cap. Oh, a red cap, yeah. And from a red cap, I went to a baggage master or baggage handler. The last so how, 10 years of my railroad life. So how does it feel, um, you know, watching the show to see um, part of um, your life, you know, that part of your lived experiences being shown, how does it make you feel? Um, what do you feel about the series? Well, I I really don't know much about this because this is being filmed in the 20s and 30s, and that was before I was born. But uh, I don't know. I happened to didn't have a job. Uh, I came in uh, on the freight train from BC and got lucky and got a job at the railway station. And that's how I wound up working there. So, and, uh, thank, thank you, Elwood. Um, so to Terry, are there particular aspects of the show that you resonate with that stand out to you? Well, for me, this is all new. Like this is way before my time. So anything that I'm captured, I'm watching on the porters. This is just all educational stuff for me. Like, um, um, to tell you the truth, all I can remember on the railway was just being a little guy, helping my dad out, jumping on the train here and there, you know, uh, running to Winnipeg and stuff back and forth, Regina back and forth. But um, outside of that, this is all new. This is just all new historical stuff for me. It's like the Black Cross nurses, like, wow. Had no idea they even existed. Yeah, so this no is just all. This is all new educational stuff for me. Hmm. Hmm. Dwayne, do you have any stories to share? Any interesting stories of being on the railway? Well, how I got my job on the railway is that I was writing my algebra exam at high school, 
and dad had called the uh, the office there and told me that I was to go meet this Mr. Brown down at uh, CN. Uh, I had a four o'clock interview and I started work at five. So, <laughs> so I think that was the message to try and get me, get me off my butt and uh, into the working life. And Yeah. And you shared some experience on, you know, getting on the train and you had a lot of family on there. Could you share some of that? Yeah. As um, my brother was saying, when we were young, we traveled the train lots. Uh, and then when I, uh, I moved to Winnipeg, um, uh, you know, I got married there. I had two daughters and they tried, they had the same experience as I did. They grew up in, uh, on the train and we call ourselves train brats. And um, yeah. the boys have traveled a couple times on the train. And, um, you know, that was our family. I tell people I was raised, raised by uh, uh, fellow porters on the train. So um, back to you, Elwood. Um, let's talk about your experience being in the railway. Um, can you just let us know what it was like working on the railway, um, what um, your day-to-day -day life um, experience was? Well, when I got on there, it wasn't that hard, eh? We, you know, we mostly all colored porters or red caps at that time. And, uh, I and finally got enjoyed and uh, working with the guys and and then uh, there used to be a turnaround here, eh? So the boys would uh, come in from Toronto and Montreal and Winnipeg. They stay overnight and then they go back out again. That's how I got to know a lot of the guys. So, but after later on, uh, the white guys got to be porters, eh? But before that, it was all. And uh, the guys used to have to shine the shoes of the people that's traveling on the train, eh? The porters. And that's all I really know about much of that. Hmm. So. Thank you. Thank you, Elwood. Um, so let's um, ask um, Dwayne's son, Nathan. Nathan, you're currently walking the railway um, <laughs> right now. And are there any similarities that you can, is there anything? What, what is the experience like, you know, working in the real way? And is there anything you can compare it to with um, the time shown in the series? Um, where I work in the railway, it's vastly different than what's experienced, like what um, the porters would have experienced back then. Uh, I'm more in with the maintenance of the train. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't get the exact direct experience of it, but I grew up riding the trains and being around the station and um you know there's like something to now that that spirit's kind of there like uh it just it just gives a great history to be around it and to be a part of it and is that did you why did you choose to walk in the railway is it because of family ties is it because of the generational thing or <laughs> yeah actually a lot of it <laughs> i was uh i was a broke actor and when needed a bit more money. It. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yes. And when the opportunity presented itself to join the the family legacy, I said, "Sure, why not?" <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we'll be taking questions. If anyone has any questions um, that you'd like to ask, please feel free to put it in the comments, and we'll be taking them. Taking them. Thank you so much for um, joining us. Um, the the maze, we're glad to have you here. Um, next, we'll have our, uh, um, I'm sorry. Just, so it's wonderful to speak to everyone. Um, next, we'll have Arnold, Charles, Muna, and Sabrine come back on and um, we'll open the floor for more questions. Hi everyone, Whew, such an interesting night. Um, so much to learn, so much to unpack. Um, and I'm sure so many people have questions for the cast and the, and the crew. So please, if you have any questions in the comments, in the comments you can just put them there. Um, but I have a question for Charles. Um, 
are we going to be saying more stories like this? Is there going to be a season two? This is just between you and the Saskatchewan people. You know. Heck yeah, there's going to be a season two. Hey. There has to be a season two. Um, Yay! It's just, it just, it just, um, you know, it, there's too much story. There's too much. By the time you get to episode eight, um, there's no way that people aren't going to want to know what's going on. And and I feel like you know that's just on the story side of things, but on the on the side of industry and in our industry, it's uh, it's critical. It's imperative that the show continues to. Uh, provide the thing that we've just broken open to provide more opportunities and for we have so much black talent in this country that didn't get to make appearances mm. first season and trust me they're hounding me <laughs> 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 um, and uh, and and so we need the canvas to continue yeah so any other shows you're going to be working on similar stories black Canadian stories that well, myself myself yeah. oh yeah. This, yes definitely um so the i have a documentary that i'll be making a, um about blackface that we mm. just got greenlit to to do um a film about africville uh mm -hmm. where that i i mean i wrote this script uh back in 2010 and it's just kind of really servicing and you know going through but 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 the the, the father the, in that in that in that in that uh story is a porter but mm. from halifax and is away from home all the time and it's about uh Africville and the disappearance of so uh, my stories and the things that I'm working on uh are definitely um I'm doing the next film I'm making is a is a reimagining of a film that was made in the 80s called uh Young Blood that starred Patrick Swayze and Rob Lowe and because I was a former hockey player uh and uh and I got a shout out uh, Ruben Mays wasn't it Ruben Mays like from North yeah. Abelford uh, Selwyn Jacob made the documentary about him, uh, who made the documentary about the Porters and the Railroad, um, one of my mentors. Anyway, um, so I'm, I'm telling the story about the experience from a black hockey player um, and reimagining the film that was made in the 80s and, and kind of taking my spin on it. So I'm constantly trying to, to inject our essence and presence in the stories and the films that I make. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, question for Glenn, uh, for um, Arnold. Um, what was it like playing draw roles um, as an executive producer and an actor as well? Dual roles or triple roles? Quadruple <laughs> uh, <laughs> roles. Quadruple <laughs> roles. You know, I mean, look, um, it was just a blessing, man. I mean, you surrounded yourself with not only a great supportive creative team, but also every day being able to see these talented people, you know, uh, do their thing on, on, on set was pretty fantastic. So uh, I enjoyed every bit of playing the, the, you know, putting on different hats. It was just such a, a, a treat. And anytime it did get difficult or tough, I just thought of what these men and women went through and, and, and how they did not give up. Uh, you know, which allows, like I said, the, the men that were porters in the 50s and 60s and 70s, the, 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 the fights and the struggles that these men in the 20s and the, and the 30s uh, fought for them to have these, to have the unions and to have the job be more beneficial for them. Um, so I just thought of those things every time we ran into, um, you know, bumps into roads. Thank you. Um, I have a question here and I'm going to throw it over to Mona. So someone says, did you get emotional getting into character? Did you ever get emotional getting into character? Yeah, all the time. It was, you know, the entire production did such an amazing job of, of creating this world for us. So, you know, there were days where we'd just walk on set and the set would be immaculately dressed and the extras were so fabulous. It was like you dropped right in. And, you know, there were moments where, especially, you know, I think uh, it was in the last episode where we did the border scene with Ronnie Rowe, who plays Zeke. Mm -hmm. 
it, I mean, I don't think that there was much time when the camera wasn't rolling where we both, both weren't very tense because we sort of really understood the weight of the moment that we were shooting and, and it felt so present with, you know, police interactions and um, uh, police violence that happens now that, you know, it was just all there. Hmm. Hmm. What about you, Sabrin? Did you, did you get emotional when you had to get into, at any time when you had to get into character? I mean, I was emotional all the time because of uh, hormones, but so it was hyper emotional. <laughs> but um, yes, when I, I remember the first time I put on my Black Cross nurse outfit in my trailer and just looked in the mirror the very first day, I was so nervous and I just started crying because I just looked at my ancestors. Like I was like, these are my, my ancestors are with me. This is my lineage. This is where I come from. I am here because of them. And to be honest, it was a lot of that looking around um, even when I was just passing by, because I never really overlap with any of the porters in the series, but even just like they're finish, finishing a scene and going back to the trailer and I'm leaving to start a scene and seeing them in their in their uniform and just really feeling emotional of like, we are paying homage to these powerful, powerful Black people in history from our communities. And the whole thing was very emotional for me for that reason. I can I can imagine. Also, um, when, when, we, when we were, when the porters were shooting their train stuff and they were doing um, the accident with Henry. I, went, I think that was one of the first days I came to set and I wasn't filming anything, but it would, I, it would just seeing all the guys in the costumes, one in their porter suits looking so fine. Mm -hmm. All of them look incredible. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, watching them do that scene and how heavy it was, it was just, it was like time traveling. I, I don't know, it was like living a living dream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, that was one of, um, that was a very, very intense scene for me. And um, it, it just, I can only imagine what it was like being at that time, not to talk of um, living those experiences. Okay, so we're I, going I, to have them. I also, I also like to say one thing and, and and Charles actually directed that that scene that we were talking about, but on an inspirational aspect of things, uh, Charles, another um, scene that Charles did was when we were all walking, all the porters are walking through Little uh, Burgundy, well Saint Antoine, and the freedom that Charles gave us in the sense of the joyousness of all these men coming together and walking through uh, Saint Antoine, and also the background performers that mm. got. Me that became organically felt like they were a part of it for two yeah. reasons. One, Charles had music playing and, and you know, we would do that scene a couple of times and people got involved, but also because I believe they were seeing black actors in the sense of doing, being them. And, and, and Charles set it up in a sense where the freedom for us to be us. And that was the beauty of it, because all of a sudden we broke out in the song and started dancing, Charles, remember? And, and the background performers were dancing. And the young people that got to look and see the Charles officers, the, um, the, the RTs, the, uh, I'm talking about people behind the scenes, um, mm -hmm. uh, the RTs, the, um, the Jordan O-Rams. And these young black boys and girls got to look up and see the greens and the amaries and in a sense you almost looked at them as if they were saying this is the possibility that i can achieve mm. and without even knowing it that's something that i think we uh, unconsciously uh did we we really left something organic in winnipeg that i think has manifested itself mm. yeah after the months uh we left mm. but thank you for that arnold and we're just going to have the maze family come back on and um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. So um, this is from Dami, my namesake. <laughs> and um, he says, what were some of the challenges working on the railway station? So I'll throw that to you, Elwood. What were some of the challenges working on the railway station? I was just wondering why... Uh... Sorry, 
I was wondering why uh, no one really brought up Shiloh Cemetery, the black uh, church and cemetery there. And uh, it would be, there's people from all over the world uh, visit that place there and put their name in the book and whatnot. And uh, it was only a colored, all colored people that was very, very. <coughs> My older brother and my mother, the rest of my family is, is buried wherever they lived. I was just wondering about that. Yeah, actually, I had had mentioned that, uh, Sparky, early on in my conversation. Yeah. That's your background, where you came from, and, and the, like the Shiloh, Shiloh Church and Cemetery has made a provincial heritage property. Yeah, so, I, I, I had it made the heritage. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And got the place cleaned up and whatnot. Yeah. What about you, um, Terry? Um, any challenges working in the real you know way what? station? You say that, but really, there wasn't many challenges at all. Um, we were hmm. all liked, well respected in the railway family. So it didn't matter wherever we went, wherever we traveled, there was always people to look after you, and you're always respected. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, there was, there was no no hard, no racism thrown in your face at all mm -hmm. as far as the uh, railway goes. None so whatever. Hmm. Arnold, I was wondering if you had any questions for um, the potters here. Do you have any questions uh, for them? Um, yeah. Um, can you tell me where was the, um, to any one of them, where was the, the, the farthest location that you went to from, like where you were based to the farthest location that you went to um, in the sense of uh, portering. Well, I, I never was a porter, eh? I no, I, I know you were. A red, I know you were a red cap, but this is a question for everybody that. Oh, okay. um, where was the furthest destination that you went to? Mine would be Vancouver. I think the via, via Winnipeg, to Vancouver. So you were Vancouver in Montreal. And how long, do you remember how long it was for you to get from there to, uh, let's say, Vancouver or from you from where you are now to Montreal? I would say four or five days. Yeah. yeah. At least. And with the, I mean, obviously, when you were, uh, um, when you were uh, a, a porter, uh, what year was that again? What was the year? I started there in 52. 52 and 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 for for the rest of the for everybody else when were you and i started in 79 79 so and i wasn't far behind that i think maybe a year before he, my brother I think you were a year before me yeah yeah did and you have uh, your name i used to work in the shops as well oh you did huh well, well they <laughs> the guys would kick me out of the shops during the summer so I would work indoors during the summer, and they would kick me outdoors during the winter. Oh, boy. So, well, it's just the way it was. All the older guys worked indoors during the summer. The younger guys worked outdoors during the winter. It was just uh, something we put up with while we were working when, on the road. When you were porter on the cars, did you have a name tag on your particular car that you were, uh, that you were portering on? Myself? No. Any one of the porters. No. Stanley Grizzle talks about in his book that, you know, one of the things that the union was pushing for back in the day was to have the name car, the name tag on the car so that when people came in, they would call them by their names as oh, okay. opposed to anything else. Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. You were yes. There? there was an entrance as you go in the, the door into your sleeper. Mm hmm there would be, you would know who the porter was, eh? And whatnot. Gotcha. Yeah, it was. See, I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's why it's called history. That's why yeah. it's history. <laughs> that's so cool. what's so great about this. Yeah. 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 I, have, I have one more because I'm sure everyone else is chomping the bits. But um, as, as a, a, a red cap, you know, one of the things when we look at some of the pictures, the black and white pictures, is the fact that they could carry like 10, you know, 12 suitcases, uh, you know, underneath the arm, or maybe they had a two-wheeler and stuff like that. 
Yes, yes. <laughs> we recall many, back many, many the largest amounts of suitcase because you wanted the tips, right? So yeah, what yeah. were the largest amount of suitcases <laughs> that you carried at one time? <laughs> Whatever they I really don't know. <laughs> Three <laughs> pairs, because we had little carts and wagons and whatnot, eh? So did you have a two-wheeler or was it just you carrying oh, by hand? We had a two-wheeler. You had a two-wheeler. And the larger two-wheeler, and then we had wagons, little wagons. They would take all the luggage off the trains. Yeah. yeah. And uh, really? sometimes it would be five or six wagon loads of baggage because you had to transfer to a different train, eh? Like to yeah. Prince Albert and stuff like that. And, and what were the tips like for you back there? What were the tips like? What would you, what were the tips like for you? Uh, they, they were they were good. I uh, when the when I first moved there, or in uh, started working, I bought furniture for a one bedroom suite in three months on tips. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. That must have been really that must have been really good tips. Yeah. <laughs> and course, what was and I used to get the like President John Diefenbaker. I used wow. to get him. Yeah. Once a week. Wow. Yeah. Always like shining that gentleman's shoes. He yeah. was so wow. respectful of us. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Great man. Yeah. I hid my tips, Arnold, because if I my dad knew how much I had, I'd have to move out soon. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind if I write that down? Do you mind if I write that down? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> See, you don't even hear me talking about tips at all. <laughs> that's that's just amazing you know one of the things that i always wanted to know you know because obviously you, i got a chance to to interview a few porters unfortunately they're not not they're not around anymore and they they were portering a lot earlier than you guys were was just how was it standing for those long periods of time with I guess when the union started the breaks, you got more and more breaks. But before, when these men were 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 in the early stages of fighting for a union, they didn't get a lot of breaks. Like from Montreal to I was uh, from Montreal to uh, Vancouver was eighty five hours and fifteen minutes with with uh, with four breaks, four hour breaks. Yeah. So how was it for you guys in the sense of standing for those long periods of time? Well, we we had a place where you could sit, eh? Same as the porters on the train after everybody went to bed. Yeah. The place where they sit and shine shoes and whatnot. Eh? Was that also the smoking area as well? Well, there, there was a smoking car on there. Uh, but they don't have them anymore, eh? But yeah, was, well, thank God. Uh, way back then, uh, I think it was called a parlor car. I'm kind of sure what kind of... It was, you could go back there and smoke and yeah. have a drink and... And all plush, very plush. Yeah. But, uh, and for and for you, Mr. Smith, beg pardon. I was asking uh, uh, Dwayne if he could tell me what. And, and for you, how was it for you in the sense of standing those long periods of time? Um, I kind of kept myself busy because I knew the you know the more I kind of stood around doing nothing, that they would being the junior man, that uh, they would find something for me to do. So I, you know, mm -hmm. most of the time I'd, I'd hang out in the uh, the red cap room, or I'd sneak downstairs and just kind of wander the the, the station. Uh, sometimes I'd go into the ticket office and uh, and chit chat with the the uh, ticket agents there. Sometimes I'd just go outside and walk around, wow. mingle with customers. Sometimes it was actually fairly busy all the time. Like if yeah. you weren't were a lot busy, if you weren't busy with the train, you had a station to clean up and look after. Yeah. Well, we were doing that in between time. And, and Carol, one quick one for you. You know, these men were gone for long periods of time. What was it like not seeing your father or your uncles for long periods of time while they were on the job? What was that like for you and your mother and your and the rest of your uh, family? Yeah. Well, I, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't personally affected. It was just my brother, and he was my older brother. So what was nice about him was, especially the time he brought home a Ray Charles record, never heard of him before. Uh, that, was, that was the biggest thing in my life when he brought that home. But uh, I, I don't really know because uh, it would be my aunts, I think, that would have been the ones that would have experienced the, the mm. long trips away. Mm. Mm. Well, those I only got a bit of that because my wife, she was a porter on the train. 
So she'd be gone uh, six, six to eight days from Vancouver to Winnipeg. So I just thought, you know, that was our, our kind of our, our nice break uh, from one another, but we're always happy to see her when she came home. There is a little, little tiny bit of history of uh, the first uh, black porter, uh, female, from, from uh, Vancouver. We, we, I, we've, everyone's tried to find uh, um, as much information as we can, but we know she existed. So she would have been around in, let's say, the 30s. But I just thought, what a cool character to have. You know what I mean? To have like a black a female porter rolling with the, 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 the guys, you know? So that's pretty cool. Yes, that would be so cool to have. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. And I just I have just two, two to quick lin I just have two quick lineage questions. Carol, uh, are you related to a Nathan Lafayette? He is my lineage? nephew, my, my brother's son, nephew? yes. Hockey player, wow. yes. I was a hockey wow. player. So. And, and, and Mays, anyone related? To, are you guys related to the R Ruben Mays? North Battle, like, you guys are in that uh, lineage? He's a cousin yeah. that grew up with his dad mm -hmm. out on the farm, out in that colored district. Yeah. Ruben couldn't play hockey, but I sure could. It's, that's the only way I could beat him. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad yeah. football player, though. <laughs> yeah, he was a really good football good. player. <laughs> Um, so a producer that I work with who has been a real mentor of mine, you know, I made this film about uh, Harry Jerome, the first documentary I made, and his father was a porter. Anyway, um, Selwyn Jacob actually made the film about Mr. Mays from, uh, uh, and also made the film about the porters. Um, so anyway, so Nathan was a hero of mine, and I loved playing hockey uh uh watching him play when i was coming up so anyway yeah yeah, yeah he was great yeah what yes. what a great note to end this on um i want to thank everyone thank you arnold thank you charles officer thank you muna thank you to um from the potter for joining us today special thank you to carol um elwood terry Dwayne, and nathan thank you for sharing your stories um, this event won't have been possible without the without Carol and the Saskatchewan African Heritage Museum. Um, thank you for all your help. And finally, a special thank you to all our wonderful um, guests, all our wonderful audience. Um, thank you for staying with us and listening to all of this. Um, as um, we round up, I would just like to let you know that the Potter is on Mondays, 9 p.m. on CBC, and is also available to stream on CBC Gem. So tell your friends, tell everyone. Um, and I would like to use this opportunity to say a big thank you to CBC Saskatchewan for giving me the opportunity to host this um, Potter Series event. It was truly an honor. Until next time, I remain your host, Dami Adeni. So please, in the comments, give me a round of applause. Just encourage me, give me a round of applause, give me a round of applause, give me a round of applause if you think I did a good job. Um, and um, there's also a giveaway. So see details um, on the screen to enter for um, the giveaway so you get three compliment there are three complimentary uh, three complimentary months of cbc gem premium access up for grabs so check the sorry um so um yeah so that's it from us thank you. next time bye everyone please clap for me in the comments if i did a good job clap for me in the comments thank you everyone bye
thing. Shoes in point, no scuffs, perfect polish. And when you walk, walk like a man with answers, because whether or not you have them, that's who you have to be. Zeke, can you make sure that my husband stays out of trouble tonight? Don't I always. Do you know who I am? I know you're in charge. Of every unholy thing that sets foot in this city. Queenie, the woman they call the Southside Butcher. When I hear somebody trying to sell me on a better life, I gotta ask myself, what is so bad about the life they got? If I wanted to get the porters into a union, what's the first thing I should do? Always go for the head. That's where the vision is. You think I need a partner? I think you need a man that knows every van in them trains. I know y'all might be scared of what might happen if we do this, but maybe it's time we start thinking about what happens if we don't. What I offer these boys is not one day maybe. It is in their hands right now. But it's union shit you talking. And that's danger. You sure you don't want to work with me? You sure you don't want to join the movement? I'm good. spend the rest of my life bowing and smiling people rather spit in my face and killing me would be a kindness no one to be a bull-headed negro motherfucker and we're not to be my poor tapapsi the most invisible man on the earth <laughs> Come down. 